Hey, I hope you all are doing well. It's uh, kind of early in the morning here, uh, just doing my morning studies. Um, like to spend some time in the morning. Right now I'm doing something that's kind of cool. This is for guys only. There's a woman's version of it, but something called the Soul Con Challenge. Um, and so it happens for, uh, I don't know how many days the challenge is. Um, looks like it's uh, 42 days, something like that. Anyway, six weeks of... Um, just stretching yourself physically, stretching yourself spiritually and all that. But that's not the only thing I'm doing this morning. I have this discipleship work I'm doing with a bunch of guys from Greg Ogden. And uh, it's really good. We've got this going on actually over in Ghana. We've got some people doing some leadership training with that book over there. Uh, as well as in Pakistan of all places. I was able to ship a, a book over there. Uh, shipped it to an address in Pakistan. Got a picture from the guy in Pakistan holding the book. And before the lockdown they were going through it and uh, shooting questions off to me when they had them and just doing discipleship in an area where the church is under tremendous pressure but um it's not why i'm doing this video the reason i'm doing this video is i've got my bible here or one of them and uh this morning part of the study was uh, to read isaiah 52 13 uh, through 53 12 and identify everything that reminds you of jesus christ this is a prophecy book right a prophetic book and so it's talking about the messiah to come and i just uh, i want to read through this and sort of do some of the thought process out loud with you uh, to show you the prophecies that were fulfilled in jesus now before i do that Keep in mind, Jesus as a historical figure. Forget about all the claims that he's God. Forget about all that stuff just for a minute. And remember, as a historical figure, uh, Jesus claimed to be God. Jesus was killed. Uh, there are records from Josephus and other people that talk about that time and confirm uh, a lot of what we read in the Bible as being completely accurate and as it uh, had happened. So Jesus was either a complete lunatic who made all these claims and died for them and had a tremendous following of people who, uh, for some reason, believed him and were willing to die for it as well, uh, or he's truly the Lord of everything. Um, and so one of the proofs or the, the good sets of evidence that we have that he is the Lord of everything is the prophecies that are fulfilled from the Old Testament, hundreds or even sometimes thousands of years before he even existed, that came true in his life. The chances of just a couple of those lining up perfectly are astronomical and I think there's some like 300 plus that were fulfilled in him uh, and no one else you can't just pick somebody out of the blue and say hey you know by the way there's all these other prophecies that weren't fulfilled and they fulfilled 300 that doesn't happen there's no one else who's ever done anything even close to that so let's look at Isaiah 52 13 through 53 12 I'm going to read from the NIV because that's what this version is uh, if you're uncomfortable with the NIV or with any version, I always suggest check out a number of different versions. Get the big picture of what Scripture says. This is a little bit of a, a different lesson. But um, read different versions and find that big picture because these are translations of the original language. What I read that was translated, let's say, in the 1950s doesn't even apply today. And things older than that don't apply today. And so you have to translate even what's in here uh, by figuring out what it was God was trying to say through the word. And what I mean by that is, let's say somebody translated the Bible in 1942, right, during the Great World War II, and they decided that they uh, wanted to take the word uh, from the Hebrew, from the Greek that's translated glad, but they didn't use glad. They used the word that they would use back then, which was, hey, I feel gay. I feel happy. I'm, I'm full of joy. Well, guess what? Today, Right now, it's 2020. If I go around saying that I feel gay, I am not telling people that I feel happy. Um, in fact, I'm telling them something completely different, a completely different arena of thought pops into their head. And so when you're reading your Bible, remember, it is the Word of God. Uh, but these are translations, and none of them are a perfect translation from what God was trying to tell us. So you have to go back and figure out what's the context of that verse? Um, what was God really trying to say? Who was he saying it to? Why was he saying it? The three questions I love to ask is what does God want me to know? What does God, God want me to feel? And what does God want me to do? And that takes digging. So again, Isaiah 52, 13 uh, through 53, 12. Forgive me. It's still early here. We're still waking up. 
So, see my servant will act wisely. Jesus was definitely a servant. He was definitely wise. Uh, he will be raised up. He was lifted up on the cross and lifted up and highly exalted. He was definitely lifted up. Um, just as there were many who were appalled at him, they were definitely appalled by him and at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being. He was beaten to a pulp. If you don't believe that, um, that's fine. But the most accurate physical description I've ever seen of what he went through is in uh, Mel Gibson's uh, The Passion of the Christ. Make sure you got your strong stomach uh, on, if you will, when you watch that. It's a very violent movie. Uh, but it accurately depicts what he went through during the pre-crucifixion and crucifixion stages uh, of his uh, his time here on this earth. Just a very short period of time and yet they made an entire movie out of it and it's incredibly accurate so um so disfigured uh beyond that of any human being and his form marred beyond human likeness again he's beaten to a pulp so he will sprinkle many nations and the kings will shut their mouths because of him now that word sprinkle if you look throughout all the different translations literally means sprinkle um, it has to do with salvation. It has to do with anointing. Um, some translate it surprise. Uh, he will surprise many nations and kings will shut their mouths. So that it's a very powerful and meaning-filled word. It doesn't just mean to sprinkle a little water or, in this case, a little blood on a situation. It means so much more than that. Um, and he definitely did that. He anointed, if you will, via sprinkling. Uh, so what they were not told, they will see. What Jesus didn't tell, he kept his mouth shut. They will see when the truth comes out, when the reckoning comes, when uh, accountability becomes a necessity, right? In the future, we all come to a place of accountability. Um, and what they have not heard, they will understand. It'll be clear. Who has believed our message and who has the arm of the Lord and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He gave power, right? We won't go to that. But uh, he grew up before him like a tender shoot. Now, this is something you don't hear about very often. Um, but Jesus, being formed in Mary by the Holy Spirit, is completely human, but also has the Holy Spirit as his spirit. You have a spirit inside of you. Uh, I have a spirit inside of me. Um, Jesus had the Holy Spirit inside of him, but he grew up. It says that he grew in knowledge and stature in the New Testament, which means that he was not always living in the mind of the Holy Spirit. He was living as a human being just as you and I do. That means he, he um, was tempted with every last thing that we are. He was troubled with things that we are and so on. He had to grow up in his maturity. I mean, even right before he gets arrested, he's in the garden going, oh God, Man, if there's some way to get around this, I would love to do something else. But you know something? Let your will be done. I, I want to do what you want to do. That's what he's saying, right? And that's a human emotional response to the situation. Um, so anyway, he grew up. And so it says here, he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. The ground was definitely dry at that point. There had been no uh, prophets other than John the Baptist for uh, hundreds of years. And all of a sudden, boom, the Messiah shows up and like changes everything, right? He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. It wasn't as if he was some pretty boy that people looked at him and went, wow, I want to follow that guy or, you know, whatever. He was a normal guy. And until he started using the wisdom that came out of his mouth uh, and the power of God that came out of his life, he was a very ordinary human being. Um, he was despised and rejected by mankind. Probably don't even need to go into that. Uh, a man of suffering, familiar with pain. The dude was chased out of places all the time, and then they killed him, right? Uh, like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. So he had followers, right? But they turned on him during the trial. There's a whole crowd outside shouting, crucify, crucify, crucify. Um, so they don't lift him up as a, a leader at some point. They actually, um, they do exactly the opposite and they, they kill him. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. That's what the whole crucifixion and the beating and all that was about. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. That's worth noting. Um, all throughout the Old Testament, you hear about God striking, cursing, coming after people to do certain things. Understand that the perspective 
from the point of creation all the way through the Old Testament is one where the picture of God has not been fully revealed to us as human beings. And so they're sharing from their perspective. They think uh, in many cases that curses come from their actions, that they come from God himself. We know if we go all the way back to the Garden of Eden, that every curse, every negative thing on this planet comes from the enemy. It's all a fruit from him not from God, and uh, but the Old Testament writers only could write within their perspective. Uh, they're not going to write outside of their perspective in many cases. And so when you see that in the Old Testament, know that God doesn't come down and zap you. Uh, you get zapped because of a broken world. You get zapped because the enemy comes after you. And you get zapped because your old man or your old person is fighting against you. And all those things are conspiring to kill you, as well as uh, maybe some other minor things. But God is always on your side. Um, so he was punished, right, by God, stricken by him and afflicted is what this says. But he was definitely punished, stricken, and afflicted. Uh, but we know because Jesus revealed the true nature and love of God that God actually didn't do those things. But Isaiah had the perspective that everything like that came from God, right? So just keep that in mind. That's my perspective on that. You may disagree. Don't get thrown off by that if you do. Um, that's a debatable matter, if you will. I just believe it's good Bible teaching um, and accurate to what the big picture of Scripture tells us. Uh, 53, five. But he was pierced for our transgression through both hands, through both feet, sword in the side, right? He was crushed for our iniquities. We talked about how badly he was beaten, even when he fell with the cross. You can imagine the cross falling on him, so it's a form of him being crushed or destroyed. Um, the punishment that brought us peace was on him. That's what the whole cross and the whole um, prosecution and beatings and all that, the scourging and flogging and all that's all about, right? It's about him suffering and taking on the price of sin, the penalty of sin, uh, on our behalf. So the punishment that brought us peace, we now have access to peace, was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. First uh, Peter 2 says, by his wounds we were healed. He's talking about past tense, because Peter had seen the crucifixion, the death, the resurrection, all that, and it's past tense to him. Isaiah is future tense. He's prophesying, saying this will happen. And by his wounds, we will be healed. We are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Jesus talks about the lost sheep, right? Each of us has turned to our own way. That's what sin is. It's selfishness. It's missing the mark and serving ourselves. Uh, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So that's what he came for. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Remember during the trial? Um, you know, they said, stand up for yourself, speak out. I mean, he could have called a legion of angels. He could have said, let them all die, you know, whatever, right? But he didn't speak a word. He took it willingly. And so he did not open his mouth. Uh, he was led like a lamb to the slaughter. Uh, lambs don't really fight back uh, all that much. They try to escape. We have some sheep and lambs in the neighborhood here. I've actually wrangled uh, a pregnant sheep in our backyard here on an off-road motorcycle for a neighbor. But let me tell you something, the sheep wasn't really all that dangerous, and it was a big, big sheep. Um, but they're not a dangerous animal. And so a lamb <laughs> is, is just this uh, meek, humble, you know, uh, little animal that just is led with almost no resistance at all to the slaughter. And that's what he did. If you think about Jesus's journey, that's exactly what he did. And as a sheep before its shearers, silent, he did not open his mouth. Again, he was silent during all that. Uh, by oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Well, what did they do? They took him away and they killed him, right? Uh, yet who of his generation protested? Just the disciples and some of the other believers were around him sort of protesting those things. Uh, for he was cut off from the land of the living. They killed him. Uh, for the transgression of my people, he was punished. Again, the cross and the beatings and all of that. He was assigned a grave with the wicked. We're talking about the grave or the, um, uh, the tomb that he was placed in, right? Uh, tombs are not places where holy things happen. Tombs are where dead bodies go. And so he was sent to someone else's grave. He was assigned a grave. He didn't choose one before he died, uh, which is another subject to actually think about. He didn't worry about where he was going to be, where he would stay. Um, he didn't even think about his grave. He knew he was going to die. Talked about it all the time. But he never said to his disciples even once, Hey, um, 
do me a favor, go purchase that little piece of land over there. That's where I want to be buried, or I want that tomb over there. He never considered that. He was assigned a grave by somebody else. Uh, and with the rich in his death, uh, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. So again, the rich, it was a rich man's tomb. Uh, he had done nothing violent, and he never spoke a lie or deceit or any type of accusations or anything like that. Uh, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And through the Lord, uh, I'm sorry, and though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, uh, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. So again, Jesus is the offering for sin. He will see his offspring. That's you and me. We're the fruit of what he did, uh, his offspring and the offspring of the disciples and so on and so forth. We're the disciples of disciples of disciples. Think about that. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. That's the kingdom come and his will being done through us, through you in this time as the church continues the work of Jesus until he comes back a second time, right? His salvation was complete, but the restoration and the renewal that happens between his resurrection and when he comes back to earth for the second time is our job. He shows up through us. He does it, but we do the work. We're not saved by works. We're saved to do good works, or we do good works because we're saved. Um, so anyway, the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. Um, after he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. Well, he suffered, he died, and he rose from the dead and saw the light of life. And he was satisfied. Um, by his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many. Talking about reconciliation, justification. And he will bear their iniquities. So that's, again, you and me. He died all these years ago, 2,000 years ago. And here we are being um, made righteous in Christ and being justified by his a sacrifice. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great. We're talking about the man, the body, Christ Jesus, uh, being lifted up and placed at the right hand of God, right? And he will divide the spoils with the strong. Uh, there, there's a whole army up there, a whole group of people uh, and beings that are just absolutely beyond our comprehension in the eternal place. Uh, because he poured out his life unto death. Without comment, that stands on its own. And he was numbered with the transgressors. He was on that cross next to two other thieves. He was in the cell, if you will, next to Bar uh, Barabbas, who was released. He was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. He prayed for the people. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. There is so much fulfilled just in those verses that's, that's three quarters of one page in this little Bible that I'm holding here. And there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of prophecies fulfilled throughout the Old Testament. Next time somebody tells you, you know, Jesus was just some guy or whatever, the mathematics don't line up. There's no way this could just happen randomly. This describes so clearly what Jesus is, was, did, and so on. So anyway, God bless you guys. I just thought you'd enjoy hearing that this morning. Hope it builds you up. Hope it gives you confidence to live your life in Christ with tremendous energy and passion to be his body, to be the light of the world. Everywhere you go, you shine in the darkness. That's what being the light of the world means. It also means that you're a city on a hill that can't be hidden. Somebody's walking through the wilderness of the unknown, full of anxiety, fear. They're lost, and they look off in the distance, and they see a bright light on a hill, the city on a hill that can't be hidden. Now they know where to go for safety. The interesting thing is when they get there, there's still a bunch of goats and stuff pooping on the ground, and it's a mess. I'm a mess. You're a mess. But we're still the city on the hill that cannot be hidden. Go and be confident that you are a God carrier today. Let the kingdom come and his will be done in you, through you, and around you, and all that you do today. God bless, guys.